Give Us More Guns is a book that describes how illegally sold guns got into the hands of South Africa's crime bosses. The decision to sell these weapons was made by one senior police official, Colonel Christian Prinsloo, and resulted in a bloodbath. The firearms were used by organized crime groups to unleash an orgy of violence so intense that in mid-2019, the South African military were called in to patrol Cape Town City's gang-infested areas. For more, we're joined by author Mark Shaw. Mark, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. What inspired the book? I, I, I had been working in Cape Town for some uh, uh, years at, at UCT, and I had been working on a previous book on, on hitmen, and stories started to seep through about the wide availability of police guns, people said, and, and initially I discounted it. Um, and so my interest in it began to to develop from there. And at the same time, the, the case of Prince Lur broke in the in the press. And so I felt I wanted to tell the the whole story of the particular case, its impact um, and the question of illegal guns generally uh, and guns being sourced from the state. So on that note, then, how are these guns that are supposed to be, you know, within state hands making their way uh, into the streets? The guns that I'm writing about really uh, come from three sources. So the first is decommissioned weapons from the police. The second is guns that were handed in uh, during amnesty, so periods in which people uh, had an opportunity to hand in guns with no questions asked. And thirdly, guns that are stored at police stations in so-called SAPS 13 stores and then are transferred to the, to the armory. And that collection of guns generally is meant to be destroyed. In this particular case, sizable quantities of them were selected and, and then sold on, uh, not only to the gangsters, there were also collective, uh, collector's items um, sourced from this uh, store and, and sold on uh, to, to other markets. So that's really how uh, the, the process worked over a number of years. There's some evidence that, of course, in bulk, I would argue that this is stopped, but there's some uh, evidence that, that uh, there's still a seepage of weapons from the state. In, in Hanover Park the other day, a gun was found linked to an, an amnesty, etc. So the question is of enormous importance, and I wanted to highlight the importance of the state controlling the guns within its possession because of insecurity that that causes ordinary South Africans. For viewers who want to understand the dynamics within uh, gangland in Cape Town and how they relate to the other smaller gangs, where do they start? Well, I think gangs generally, uh, the, the point is globally, uh, uh, gangs have evolved dramatically over the last number of decades in different urban centers around the world, in Latin America, Brazil in particular, in North America, um, in, in leading parts of Europe and Asia. And that also applies in South Africa, in particular in, in Cape Town. So the first starting point of analysis is that gang formation is generally the result of a social, political, economic failure. It's an excluded group of people. Uh, it's, gang formation is often historical. Indeed, that's the case in Cape Town. And gangs evolve over time. And uh, they are supercharged by uh, the drug economy. If you look at Central America or Mexico, that also applies in Cape Town. And they are supercharged by their capacity to, to access weapons. Weapons provide a means in which territories can be defended, in which violence is dramatically upscaled. Uh, and so I think that's a, 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 the, the important point to, to understand a, a, around gangs. South Africa has a really a, a classic if you like, challenge of gangsterism in the Western Cape, but not only, Nelson Mandela Bay, around Johannesburg. Um, and, and, and this is, you almost have to see it at, at, at two levels, a set of higher level organized crime figures, relatively small in number, 20, 30, who have national prominence, and then a larger number of, of uh, gang members. As, as you can see in the book, there's a count of those per gang, around 100,000 with different relationships to the gangs. Um, and the constellation of policy responses, as the book argues, is quite a complex one to solve it. But tackling guns is a key issue. Right. Before I let you go, we meet a character called Colonel Prince Lou. And as you mentioned in the book, he, he was not the first one to get the guns into uh, the streets of Cape Town. When did we start seeing a steady flow of state guns uh, on the streets? 
I would say 2006, 2007, the, the transfer started uh, till around 2011, 12 uh, um, uh, uh, would have been the case. And these would be bulk suppliers. So speaking to gang members, as the book recounts, we're talking boxes of, of guns. Um, many of them, the Z88, so the police issued decommissioned uh, uh, weapon. So over this period, and the homicide rate in Cape Town started to pick up around 2011, 2012. And what people in the gang environment told me is as the gang, as the guns began to flow, you know, people, there was just more access to guns than there had ever been historically. Usually gangs, of course, had access to guns, but they, they loaned them out. You had to return them to the gang boss on pain of injury or death. In a very short space of time, ordinary uh, gang members had access to guns as a status symbol. And that ramped up the violence dramatically over a period. I, I don't think we should underestimate the impact of the of this bulk supply of, of firearms. Right. Mark, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. That is Mark Shaw, who is the author of a new book titled Give Us More Guns, How South Africa's Gangs Are Armed. Uh, I'll be back with more news at the top of the hour. Your weather details up next.